on the press release for this conference, there was a byline under my name, and it said exactly that, Don Quixote scholar and punk rock veteran. Now, these two things, they don't sound like they go together at all, but we are the sum of our experiences. As it turns out, in punk rock, almost everything is socio-political, and sometimes it's nothing more sophisticated than smash the system. But at its best, the message moves through more subtly and as powerful as a tidal wave. The first time I read Don Quixote in the back of a tour van in some small town whose name I don't want to remember, I was swept away, and I was hooked. The story of the old gentleman who loses his mind and believes he's the great knight Don Quixote is not only a great novel, but the first modern novel. And not only that, the biggest selling book of all time, second only to the Bible. When Don Quixote recruits his less than brilliant neighbor, Sancho Panza, to join him as a squire, they set off on a series of unforgettable and really entertaining adventures. In the decades since my first read of the book, I've studied Spanish, coded language, the history of the Inquisition, and I'm just now starting to get a better feeling for the power of the novel. This presentation, with just a quick peek at that voyage, is called The Quixote Code. My story begins on the very first page of the novel, the dedication. This is the first text credited to Cervantes in the entire novel. Yet, in the edition I read, a footnote at the bottom said that a large chunk of it had been plagiarized from another text. This made me very curious, so I looked into it further and found that another critic had also looked into it and found even more lines plagiarized from that same book. I decided at this point to look at the source text. Well, it turns out that a few pieces that they had said were stolen were actually not. They were adapted or changed to fit together in a logical way. And even more surprising, neither one of those critics noticed these additional three lines that had also been taken from that book. Such a patchwork takes effort, as we can see from the edition that the lines came from. The very first piece stolen by Cervantes came on the first page of the dedication by Fernando de Herrera. Then, a few pages later, in the second section of the book, he takes another part, and so on and so forth, back and forth, changing a plural here, making a verb agree there, to make it all go together. So why did he do it? All academics agree that it was plagiarized, but they're not so sure about the reasons. One says, well, he was just at a loss for words. He just got done writing a 600-plus page novel, and now that one page of dedication was just too much for him. <laughs> okay. Other scholars say, well, he was just lazy. But wait a minute. This patchwork takes great effort, as we see. So it can't be said that this was easier than writing 162 words. So this is where I begin to build a theory of mind of Cervantes. Now, what a theory of mind is, is a model in my own mind to imagine what he might have been thinking. It's always uncertain and subject to change depending on the evidence that one gains in the course of the investigation. So I started very skeptically by considering what he claimed was his intention to ridicule and destroy all those books about knights in shining armor, riding off on adventures, saving damsels in distress. Well, the punk rocker in me wasn't buying it. Something wasn't right. After all, if he knew those novels so well and loved them, then why would he want to destroy any books? Something just smelled fishy. This was the time of the Inquisition. So, even violating a small church rule could result in death at the stake for someone violating them. Even worse, if you possessed the wrong book, it was equally dangerous. Several books were banned. This was the time of the first book ban in the world. All books deemed heretical by the Catholic Church were on the list, and any portion of the Bible in any language other than Latin. This struck me as very interesting, especially because 
as it turned out, the pieces that he had stolen from the dedication came from two separate sections of the text. The stolen book had a section that talked about the need to replace Latin as the language of the empire. After all, Rome had Latin, now Spain should use Spanish. And the other parts came from sections talking about the importance of biblical texts. This led me to investigate a little bit more what was going on with these banned Bibles in Spanish. Turns out there were several different editions, usually printed outside of Spain, and came complete with fake inquisitorial seals to show that they'd been approved, just to fool the authorities. These were then smuggled into Spain at risk of death for anyone found possessing them. One particular Bible really drew me in. This is the first translation into Spanish of the Bible. And it, the reason I was so drawn to it, though, wasn't because it was the first. It was because of the image on the cover. There was a man here on the right who was taller and thinner and older, reminded me a little bit of Don Quixote. He even had an unusual piece of headgear. On the left-hand side, a figure who was a little bit younger and shorter and stockier, who was very reminiscent of Sancho Panza. Looking a little bit closer at the image, we could see that the label ES Ancho L lines up with him, which means and is why the in the context of this paraphrase of Matthew 7.13. But more interestingly, the label Sancho lines up exactly with his body. <laughs> this seemed like a strong coincidence to me, but even more so, if we read this little chunk of text in Spanish, it sounds identical to, and he is Sancho, es Sancho, el, because of a lesion that happens with the S's in Spanish. But there are many, many more things that connected this particular Bible cover to the text of Don Quixote, and this got me off on a new tangent. I developed a new theory of mind, a new working one, that Cervantes used ekphrasis, which is basically describing a picture in words, no more than that. That he used this to refer to um, topics that were banned by the Inquisition. As it so happens, this is a big part of my upbringing. My father, a real Renaissance man, a respected scientist and an artist with several pieces in the Smithsonian. When I was a young child, he would regularly tell me to look at an image and tell me what was in it, to describe what was in it in words. So really, what I was doing now was looking for sections describing images and trying to find the source. This new theory of mine, though, triggered a memory of the famous Jesus fish, or ichthys. This was a way that early Christians used to communicate their beliefs to one another during the time of the Roman persecutions. Essentially, the letters inside of the fish spell fish in Greek, but each individual letter forms the acrostic, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. Well, just before, um, before going to this next section, I want to relate a little anecdote. I believe Professor Manson is here. In 2005, I took a course on Don Quixote here at Purdue, and at one point, early on in the class, Professor Mansing said, there were all these theories out there about where the name Quixote came from. No one was 100% sure which one could have been right. And he even mentioned a real madman who had noticed that the letters inside the fish looked a lot like the last five letters of Quixote. Well, <laughs> he said it didn't matter, that it had nothing to do with anything, but at this point in my investigation, I thought, no, this is significant. I need to find out who this deranged critic was. So I sunk myself into the library, hours of search, looking through books, doing internet searches, just to see if I could figure out who it was. I had no luck. I couldn't find him. Well, Professor Mansing was on sabbatical, so I decided I'd fly to Spain and talk to him in person, because this was important. It was also fun to go, of course. <laughs> and when I spoke to Professor Mansing, he listened to my story, and then he said, Mass, the madman was me. <laughs> and of course, he didn't want to publish it. And then he said, but look, Mass, it really is crazy, and it has nothing to do with anything. Plus, where's the cue? And I said, well, Professor Mansing, look, the fish is the cue. And he said, very nice, Mass, very nice, but no. <laughs> patted me on the back, told me to get a little more sleep. 
But as it turns out, the fish never appeared outside of the letters until the 20th century. From Roman times up until the 20th century, it was always shown on the side of the fish or above it or below it, and never around it. Therefore, I thought maybe it was worth considering it more and looking at the text to see if there's anything in it that reflected this idea of anicthus. And as it turns out, there's one very curious piece of text in which Don Quixote is speaking to another character from the book, and the character tells him, Quixote, there's a book out there about your adventures. Well, he answers, well, whoever that ignorant writer must have been, he must be like that horrible painter who was so bad, he would paint a rooster and then write rooster next to it in Gothic letters. In fact, for anyone to understand it, there will need to be a commentary to make it understood. So now this is a lot like the ichthys, which is a rudimentarily drawn fish with fish written next to it in Greek letters. Very similar, or at least I thought. First of all, according to this paleography book, in the manuscript of the 15th and 16th century in Spain, this was the cue. <laughs> that was very interesting. I thought that was something that at least indicated I might be going in the right direction. But next, researching Gothic letters, it turns out that Gothic was not what we call Gothic letters today. Not at all. It was the alphabet of the Goths, the Visigoths, the first Christian rulers of Spain. And as it turns out, they didn't have their own alphabet. They adapted the Greek alphabet. So when Cervantes says Gothic letters, he means Greek letters. Now the coincidences were really piling up. After all, in intelligence work, there's this famous dictum, which comes from a real authority, the movie Goldfinger. <laughs> Ian Fleming says, once is coincidence, twice is happenstance, three times is enemy action. Yeah. Coincidentally, perhaps, Gothic letters were the most common ones used in Spanish spy codes. Interesting. Interesting. Also, I mentioned the intelligence. It just so happens that there is a very, very good likelihood that Cervantes worked for Spain's secret intelligence service at a time when Spanish spies regularly encoded messages in code, encrypted them. But we're not done yet. We put them together, and I tried to put together the closest-looking Gothic letters to the Greek letters and see how they looked. Well, it clearly looks like the ichthys, but even more so, it also clearly spells Quixote. Is that all? Well, as it turns out, I'd missed something up until this point. It turns out that the word gallo, which means rooster in Spanish, also is the name of a type of fish, the Zeus Faber. And this fish is one that has many, many connections with biblical stories. Legend has it, it's the very fish that Jesus singles out in Matthew 17. Hmm. <laughs> well, if that were not enough, it turns out that that same story is repeated all through the Mediterranean, where Cervantes had sailed widely in military service in Greece, also Italy, Spain, and North Africa. But, even more interestingly, in Greece, this fish has a different name. It's called the Christopsaro, which means Christ's fish. So, when Don Quixote tells us that his story is like that of a badly drawn gallo, a.k.a. Christ's fish, and that it needs a label next to it written in Greek slash Gothic letters, could this all be a coincidence? Anything's possible. But in intelligence work, there's a limit to the number of unusual simultaneously occurring events that we can write off as coincidence. This one's definitely past James Bond's limits. <laughs> at some point, we must at least consider the possibility that the ex-spy Cervantes was back to his old tricks, maybe even writing a Quixote code. Thank you.